So again, thank you for the invitation uh, to come speak to you all today. Um, so I was asked to speak about cancer biomarkers. Historically, I did a fair amount of work in, in this field, cancer biomarkers, and now um, I do more in cancer therapeutics and developing new drugs. But hopefully what I would like to do today, what I'd like to do today is provide you with an overview of what cancer biomarkers are, uh, give you a flavor for some of the different molecules that can be used as, as cancer biomarkers, um, and really the, the tremendous challenge that exists in identifying new biomarkers. There are relatively few of them, uh, and as Dr. Kulesa just mentioned, um, you know, they are in some cases rel relatively difficult to get. So there's a big challenge in, in accessing the human body uh, and then using different uh, biomarkers, which can come in a lot of different flavors, to diagnose cancer. Uh, and so I'll give you a little bit of a flavor for that today. So the first thing that I'd like to, to, to get across is that there's an extremely high diversity of potential cancer biomarkers. So we, ex we exist in our human bodies, and there's a certain homeostasis that goes on. There's only, uh, and, and there's a huge number of molecules that can be perturbed uh, in the context of a developing neoplasm in the human body. And so the challenge is, to identify any specific molecule. And I put this example here of, of a lung cancer, right? So here you have uh, the human lung, and let's just assume that there's a tumor growing in that lung. So that tumor, of course, um, is derived from cells that were naturally there in the lung, but the homeostasis of the proteins, the nucleic acids, the uh, phospholipids, the sugar molecules, everything have been perturbed in the context of this tumor. And any one of those molecules could potentially serve as biomarkers. So let's just say we have a tumor here. We have the tissue here. We have nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, phospholipids, anything flowing into the bloodstream, perhaps, so that you could take a blood sample from this patient and then begin to diagnose very early, uh, based upon the presence or absence of these biomarkers, the presence of this uh, tumor. The other thing that can happen, of course, is cancer isn't a, a normal process. The body can react to cancer in a specific way. And the body's reaction, let's say an immune reaction to a specific tumor, that can generate specific biomarkers due to the presence of the tumor and the body's reaction to it. So you don't necessarily need to find something from the tumor itself. You can actually identify biomarkers by how the body is reacting to the presence of that uh, tumor. I put lung up here uh, because everything's on the table. We want to diagnose cancer very early. So for instance, a number of novel technologies, so the individuals sitting in this room can be involved, of course, in the identification of novel biomarkers. The lung sits uh, at a location where we're breathing in and out, perhaps breathing in and out over those tumor cells. So something as crazy as, as for instance, volatile organic carbon, you know, volatile organic substances you're breathing in and out may in fact be used to signal the presence of uh, a lung cancer, et cetera. So anything's on the table, extremely high diversity of potential biomarkers. The question is, can you find them? The other thing that you'd like to be able to do, of course, is to be able to access them. And Peter just gave you a, a great uh, overview of ways that we access tumors. We only have so many entry points into the human body. We only have access to so many fluids. And of course, those are the ways that we need to find, uh, places that we need to find these biomarkers. The other thing is you like to find them early, right? So if we were going to diagnose a lung cancer, a prostate cancer, breast cancer, you wanted to define, uh, find those lesions early so that the patient has the, the potential uh, for the best outcome. Uh, the problem is, uh, as the number of biomarkers gets up, so the perturbations of the homeostatic balance, as they go up, uh, as the cancer gets worse and worse, sure, there may be more biomarkers, but the clinical utility of them may go down from the standpoint of actually helping the patient uh, who has the cancer. So illustrates the fact that we need to detect them, uh, low numbers of them potentially, at very low numbers to detect the cancer early, uh, and quantity so that we can detect the cancer early so the patient can have potentially the best outcome. So this is just a survey. So most of the time when you're looking for cancer-specific biomarkers, lots of different technologies are on the table with regard to finding them, right? So we have um, specific ones. So you may have a cancer biomarker in mind. You can use a specific antibody, as, as Peter just mentioned, to look for them. Uh, but there are also large-scale techniques to look for any number of molecules that may be up or down regulated in the context of cancer versus in healthy patients and healthy tissue. This is just a huge spattering of them, right? So gene expression profiling, gene sequencing to look for uh, nucleic acid-based markers, serum proteomics and peptidomics to look for serum proteins that are going up or down based upon the presence of uh, a growing uh, malignant neoplasm, mass spec-based techniques, protein arrays, secreted proteins, etc. Tons of different technologies, lots of them, ones that are available to do 
high throughput screening of biological tissues or uh, fluid samples in order to begin to understand what's different in patients with cancer versus those patients that uh, are normal. I will say that in reality, there are relatively few uh, clinically significant biomarkers. So there's a significant need uh, for all of you uh, to help to develop new technologies and to identify new biomarkers that allow us to do lots of different things when it comes to cancer from the standpoint of diagnosing and treating patients. What do we use biomarkers to do? Um, so here is just a list of, of multiple different things that biomarkers enable uh, from the standpoint of patients with cancer. So risk assessment. So they are able to, for instance, assess one's risk of getting cancer. So uh, here's the example of BRCA1 and BRCA2. There's a recent example, of course, of Angelina Jolie carried a mutation uh, in one of these proteins here, which predisposes her. It increases her risk of developing breast in the, ca breast in the case of both of these cervical uh, ovarian cancer. So she elected, based upon her risk profile, to have a mastectomy and then a reconstruction. So an example of how you can use a biomarker, in this case, mutations in these genes to act to uh, in, 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 uh, prevent, uh, the, uh, prevent cancer. Diagnosis and screening. And so here we're talking about, as I mentioned before, detecting cancer early. So identifying biomarkers that allow you to detect the presence of a malignant neoplasm early so that you can treat uh, early. So prostate-specific antigen is a highly controversial example in the context of prostate cancer, um, work that I've, a lot of which uh, PSA is, is a molecule that I've spent a lot of time on. I'm sure everybody's heard of prostate-specific antigen. And fecal occult blood testing. This is, a, this is a screening test that I'll talk about here in a minute as an example. So looking for blood, something as simple as blood in your stool, to detect early uh, malignant neoplasms, for instance, in the colon. Prognosis and treatment decisions. So this was a lot about uh, what, what Peter just mentioned. So the presence of specific molecular markers in tumor specimens can give you a very good idea what the prognosis of the patient is based upon whether or not there are drugs that specifically target those alterations. And so the estrogen receptor, for instance, in a breast cancer, right? the presence of that molecular marker in an individual tissue specimen uh, from, from breast cancer allows you to use specific drugs to treat them. HER2 new is another example from breast cancer, which allows you to use specific therapies, which of course, mo that modulates your treatment decision, but of course, modulates how well the patient's going to do. Uh, pharmacology, there are ways to use molecular biomarkers, gene sequencing, et cetera, um, to see whether or not individuals metabolize cancer drugs. So when you give patients ca toxic cancer drugs and they can't metabolize them, they can build up uh, and that can lead to significant morbidity uh, in the patient. And so there are biomarkers to understand how people metabolize cancer drugs. And then finally, treatment response. So there are biomarkers that allow you to, once you've diagnosed a patient with cancer, treated the individual, then to follow those biomarkers in time to see whether or not the treatment was durable. So in the case of prostate cancer and prostate-specific antigen, once you've removed the prostate, you sample a patient's blood, there should be no prostate-specific antigen left because, as the name implies, it's a specific molecule made exclusively of the prostate. Um, and that's, for the most part, true. And in the patients that you're following over time, the PSA level, of course, begins to rise. You're worried that the prostate cancer's uh, returned and that you needed to give subsequent therapies. So you can follow patients based upon the presence or absence of specific uh, molecular biomarkers. So these are the reasons that, uh, a list of reasons why cancer biomarkers are important. I also want to briefly go over the evaluation of, of biomarkers. And so this is the concept of sensitivity and specificity. So these words are thrown around a lot when people are trying to understand biomolecular detection, whether or not a biomarker uh, gives you any indication about um, any of these processes in the context of an image of cancer. And so I don't want to belabor this point, certainly not a, a statistics course. Uh, but I just want to familiarize you with the terminology such that if you get involved in developing biomarkers, um, you've at least heard these terms. And so ses sensitivity and specificity is the way that you begin to evaluate a new test that you're developing uh, at, with regard to identifying a new biomarker. And you're comparing it against individuals that you know to have the disease. And in most cases, uh, tests that with more or less 100% certainty are able to diagnose that, uh, that cancer. And so let's give a, just a, su a super quick um, example. And so let's take colon cancer uh, as, as the example. Um, the gold standard way to diagnose a colon cancer is to take uh, a colonoscope, um, go up, visualize the lesion, take a biopsy of it, send it to the pathology lab. You can more or less get 100% uh, uh, diagnosis 
in the presence of, for, for, for colon cancer. Um, so that's our gold standard test that we are going to see whether or not, for instance, screening patients for blood in their stool, uh, how that uh, compares to our gold standard test. So this is our interesting screening test that we're looking uh, at developing uh, uh, fecal occult blood as a biomarker for colon cancer. And so let's take, uh, let's say colon cancer in a specific population has a prevalence of 15%. So we know that 15 people out of 100 people in this population have colon cancer. And so if we do a colonoscopy on these patients, we're going to have 15 people that turn up positive, right? And we're going to have 85 people that come up negative. And we want to know how good our screening test is at identifying those patients without having to do a colonoscopy, okay? And so our screening test, let's say, 10 people come up positive on the screening test, um, but five people come up negative that we know have the disease. So the sensitivity of a test is the proportion of patients that test positive uh, versus the patients that have a test negative, so a false negative test. We know they have the disease, but the test doesn't identify it. So that's called the sensitivity. That's a 67%, right? Uh, so it's, uh, it's 10 over 10 plus 5. 67%, this test is correct in identifying those people um, that have disease versus the test coming up negative. The specificity is good for telling whether a patient doesn't have the disease, right? So the specificity is when the screening test comes out negative and the patients, by gold standard testing, don't have the disease. So in this case, the specificity is 45 over the total number of patients that came up with the test negative, which is 53%. So this, the characteristics of this test are the specificity is 67%, and the specificity, the ability for the test to say that it's negative when it truly is, uh, is 53%. But what clinicians really need to know are really the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. They want to know that if they subject the patient to this test and it comes out positive, what are, is the likelihood the patient actually has the disease? Right? So with fecal occult blood testing, right, looking for blood in the stool, this kit test, right, 10 patients come up positive, but 40 people um, are test negative. Right? They don't have the disease. So this has a positive predictive value. If the test is positive, only like 20% of the people actually will have the disease if you do a colonoscopy on them. Okay? And the negative predictive value is, of course, the number of people that are negative um, that truly don't have the disease. So it's 545 over uh, 50, which is 90%. So if the test comes back negative, you're pretty sure uh, that these individuals don't have the disease. And so every screening test, right, so every diagnostic test, every biomarker test um, should be subjected to this type of analysis to understand just how powerful it is with regard to the patient population of interest and what you're really trying to do with the test. Realize, too, that there's always a trade-off, right? What you'd like to have happen is that your test is 100% specific. Right? and 100% sensitive. So every time it comes out positive, the patient has the disease, and every time it comes back negative, the patient doesn't have the disease. But unfortunately, that is not the reality, and there's typically a trade-off between the sensitivity and specificity of developing new tests um, as biomarkers for individuals with cancer. Okay, and so, actually I thought there was another slide in there, but if it's not there, that's okay. I gave you a paper, I think, and it may, the slide may pop up, I gave you a paper showing that in fact that's really the truth, that patients um, and physicians compare uh, the performance of diagnostic tests that are developed in the lab, in this case fecal occult blood testing, versus gold standards in order to understand whether or not they have a cost-benefit analysis, and whether they give any information whatsoever, because it's part of the other conversation with regard to cost, reimbursement, et cetera. So let's look at a couple of examples. So let's look at um, diagnosis. Uh, and screening. So colorectal cancers are really good one. Colorectal cancer is the third most common killer uh, among cancers in both men and women uh, in the United States. Uh, there are different biomarkers uh, that are used for, for colon cancer. Here's a molecular marker uh, that predicts whether or not individuals will get, uh, it's called KRAS, whether patients will get uh, colon cancer. Um, multiple other biomarkers have been looked at, uh, but let's look at fecal occult blood testing. So you go to the doctor's office, a stool sample and test whether or not there's blood there. And the question is, if there's blood in your stool, does that mean you have a colon polyp or a malignant lesion in the colon? There's lots of different ways for you to detect this. This is a fecal occult blood test. You can, uh, uh, again, it detects blood in the stool. Certainly, with regard to screening tests specifically, they should be simple, right? They should be simple and cost effective. They should be cheap, easy, um, and then they should have some, some element of 
predictive value uh, for, for the patients. And so this is an example of a kit that you can get. Um, you can get in physicians' offices. You can buy these. Um, turns out that fecal occult blood tests come in two different flavors. And this is what one looks like. Very simple test. So you can take a sample of stool, smear it into the window of these uh, tests, uh, and then you add a developer, uh, which uh, has a guaiac. This is the uh, guaiac test. And if there's presence of blood there, this thing will turn blue. Right? So a very simple biomarker, blood in the stool, to perhaps predict whether or not an individual has colon cancer. Turns out there's a couple of different types of these tests, and they're very cheap, easy ways to screen for colon cancer. Here's the paper that I was thinking about that was going to pop out earlier. And they do, in, the, in this paper, for instance, they do exactly like I told you they do. They take patients that are going to have a colonoscopy. They use one of these fecal occult blood tests to test for blood in the stool, and they compare the performance of this test versus what they get with the gold standard test, colonoscopy, and biopsy. And so this test, in fact, has a sensitivity of 69%, a specificity of 73.2%, and a positive predictive value of 7.3%. So every patient who came through, right, who had a positive fecal occult blood test, only 7% of those patients actually had colon cancer when they did the diagnostic test. But it's a relatively small price to pay, right, in order to detect colon cancer at perhaps a very early stage where you can actually do something about it. Okay, so let's go to one more example, and I'll give you a couple of examples of, of things that we're working on. Uh, and as I mentioned to you, there aren't a whole lot of cancer biomarkers. And so we need to expand the pool of cancer biomarkers in order to, to <clears throat> perhaps improve the care of patients. So here's a very unique biomarker, uh, and that is the presence of circulating tumor cells. And so most cancers develop um, from the epithelium, right? Epithelium of our bodies, those are the cells that are exposed to most of the uh, most toxins, the lung, the colon, stomach, etc. Uh, these are the uh, epithelial tissues that are exposed to maximal insult, so those are the ones that typically become cancerous. And so what happens through the progression of cancer is an epithelial cell uh, laying on a basement membrane will go through a number of transformative processes. Those epithelial cells will become malignant, and unfortunately at times, they will leave their primary location and metastasize uh, from, the, uh, from the local region out from the glandular structures that typically house them, enter the blood vessel, and enter distant sites of metastasis. And of course, this is a significant problem for patients with cancer. Metastasis is extremely deadly. Taking a local disease that you could potentially cure by just cutting the lesion out to a systemic disease that requires chemotherapy and typically has a pretty significantly worse prognosis. And so these circulating tumor cells, identifying tumor cells in the bloodstream, could potentially be used to prognosticate patients. Patient walks in, has a breast tumor, for instance, mammogram detected breast tumor. You do a biopsy. It's malignant. You want to know whether or not this is a local process, one confined to the breast, or this is one that's systemic. Circulating tumor cells, breast tumor cells, have gone from the primary location out into the bloodstream, and are beginning to set up sites of metastasis that you can't detect with any other conventional testing like imaging. You can't see anything on a bone scan. You can't see anything on a CT scan. But there may be, in fact, these cells floating around that have very significant prognostic value. If they're there, the patient would have a worse prognosis than if they're not, right? And diagnostic value, right? So if you're treating a patient with metastatic disease, lots of circulating, tumors floating, circulating tumor cells floating around, give the patient a therapy, what you'd like to see, of course, is the number of circulating tumor cells fall, right? To give you an indication the treatment's actually working versus the circulating tumor cells, for instance, going up, giving you an indication that it's not. So there are some uh, conventional technologies to do this. They don't work very well. We don't necessarily need to uh, go into the details about them. We're working on ways in the laboratory to use nanotechnology to improve the ability to detect circulating tumor cells and ultimately make the diagnostic and prognostic decisions that I just uh, talked about. And so these are interesting nanoparticles. They were developed in uh, Chad Merkin's laboratory. Uh, these are called nano flares. Um, what you have here is a gold nanoparticle. It's 13 nanometers in diameter. Um, and you have two DNA sequences bound to the surface of the particle. One of the sequences is near covalently bound there through a gold file linkage. Uh, and the other sequence is bound to the, the, the sequence that's, that's covalently coupled to the surface of the particle through Watson Crick base pairing. On the end of that is a molecular fluorophore, and when in close proximity to the gold particle, the fluorophore is quenched. If these particles are delivered to cells, they go into the cells, enter the cytoplasm, 
and engage a specific messenger RNA target, which binds to the sequences on the surface of the particle, it kicks off this fluorophore labeled sequence. And by doing that, it liberates the fluorescence. And so this is the flare concept, right? So in binding a complementary messenger RNA sequence in the cytoplasm, you liberate a fluorescence uh, signal inside of an individual cell. And so there's this notion that if we take these particles and we go through this workflow, we can actually detect circulating tumor cells in a blood sample. So here's how we're doing this. We're taking blood either from individuals that are healthy or individuals that have a diagnosis of, in this case, breast cancer, but you can pick any cancer that you'd like. Um, we take this, in, the, in this patient sample, here we're actually doping in cells, but in the patient sample, of course, we're looking for these cells. We're looking for cancer cells floating around in here. We add the nano flares. The nano flares enter the cells in the blood sample. If they engage specific molecular targets within those cells, they light up. We then use a flow cytometer to separate those cells out to see whether or not they're there. And in the case of following patients, see whether they're going up and down to see whether or not treatment's working or not. And so here's an example of what the output from an assay like this looks like. Uh, here we have an individual. Let's say it's a control patient. This is a uh, flow cytometry uh, histogram. These are all the cells. Each one of these individual spots represents an individual cell. It's been counted on the flow cytometer. Um, here you're looking at side scatter, just a measure of the cells going through the flow cytometer. And here you're looking at the fluorescence uh, from these nanoparticles, specific for, in this case, let's say circulating tumor cells. Okay? And so you see this cell population here. This is a healthy patient. Over here, though, we have a patient that has metastatic breast cancer. And what you can see coming up in this, in this patient sample is this population of cells right here. So they scatter similarly to the normal cells here in this individual patient, but they have a very high fluorescence here imparted by the presence of the nanoflare engaging a specific target for a circulating tumor cell. So it's this population of cells, for instance, that is the biomarker in this patient for, in, the case, in this case, circulating tumor cells. The question is, can we then prognosticate and say this patient has a worse prognosis, let's say, than this patient who doesn't have any, right? Then, can we follow this cell population? Let's say there's 500 of these cells per milliliter. Can we give this patient a chemotherapy, treat her, and then watch these cells go away as the patient responds to the chemotherapy, using this circulating tumor cells as the biomarker? Okay? And the third thing that would be really tremendous is if we could actually isolate this population of cells, grow it up and culture it in regular uh, tissue culture media uh, in, in vitro, uh, and then begin to screen these, this cell population against different drugs. So this individual patient may be on a set of drugs that she's not particularly responsive to. These, number, these cells go up. The question is what chemotherapies of all the chemotherapies that exist might she be responsive to? Well, let's take those cells, let's find ways to culture them in vitro and then just treat them with all the different chemotherapies we know and figure out which ones she's sensitive to and then give her those. So another way, three ways that we can use this specific biomarker to potentially increase the, 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 uh, the prognosis for a, a hypothetical patient that we're talking about. And finally, I'll give you one other example uh, of, of a way that we can use nanotechnology, in, in my case, to uh, detect um, new biomarkers. And so, Prostate cancer uh, is the most common cancer among American men, the second cause, common cause of, of cancer death in men. It's the equivalent, if you will, uh, with regard to numbers uh, as breast cancer is in women uh, here in men. Uh, and the question is, we want to detect prostate cancer extremely early. As I mentioned, biomarkers are extremely powerful, and you can detect localized disease, cut it out, cure the patient. If it's a systemic disease, can't cut it out, you've got to give systemic therapy. Prognosis is significantly worsened illustrated by these numbers here. So the five-year survival for localized prostate cancer. A man walks in, uh, he has localized prostate cancer, you take it out, 100% of these men are alive at five years, 100%. On the other hand, if the cancer has invaded through uh, the basement membrane, become a systemic process, a metastatic process, their five-year survival is 28%, right? Illustrating the fact that we need to identify biomarkers that allow us to detect this disease extremely early so that it doesn't become metastatic, ending up in bone scans that look like this. This is a bone scan on a patient with metastatic prostate cancer, and all of these black lesions are metastatic lesions riddling the axial skeleton of this patient. So microRNAs. So microRNAs are small non-coding nucleic acids, uh, which may in fact be very powerful next generation biomarkers. So they're typically 19 to 22 nucleotides in length, and what they do is they maintain the robustness of protein translation inside of human cells. 
And the way they do that is they modulate protein translation. Um, uh, and, th and they do that by a mechanism that's illustrated here with this cell. So microRNAs are first made in the nucleus. Uh, they're processed. They end up in the cytoplasm uh, where they are further processed, where the short microRNAs can do a couple of different things. One of the things they can do is bind to messenger RNA sequences and lead to the degradation of that messenger RNA sequence, shutting down the expression of that particular protein. The other thing they can do is simply repress protein translation. They bind to it. They don't lead to its degradation. But they reduce the amount of protein that's being produced from that specific messenger RNA sequence. The other interesting thing about microRNAs, though, is that they not only work inside of the cell, but they can be packaged into um, perhaps exosomes bound to lipoproteins, and they end up in the serum, right? So they become extracellular RNAs that are extraordinarily stable uh, and that can be potentially detected in the bloodstream as biomarkers. So in the case of prostate cancer, localized prostate cancer, we have a, we have a diagnostic conundrum. We have prostate-specific antigen that allows us to diagnose prostate cancer in individual patients. But one of the things we don't really know is which patients that we do, do we need to operate on and which patients can we successfully watch such that the prostate cancer will have no uh, detrimental effect uh, and reduce their, their life expectancy. And so one of the things we think is that localized prostate cancer has a spectrum, spectrum of behavior, as I just mentioned, um, and potentially as one goes from a more differentiated prostate cancer to a less differentiated prostate cancer, there are microRNA profiles associated with that pathologic progression, okay? And the notion is we may be able to detect these in the serum if we had a technology that allowed us to do that. Of course, detecting the microRNAs at very low copy numbers in order to detect very early prostate cancer. So I illuminated the problem. Uh, so one of the things that we need to do, of course, though, is develop a screening technology that allows us to detect changes in microRNA expression across the spectrum of all the microRNAs that, that are known. And so there are several thousand microRNAs that are known. So we need a technology that we can use to take patients with high-grade cancer, low-grade cancer, and healthy patients and begin to understand from their serum profiles of microRNA how to separate them and understand which microRNAs are specific to um, patients with aggressive disease. And what you see here is an array. So each one of the spots on this array corresponds to a single human microRNA target. And on the surface of the array, we've used gold nanoparticles, as, I showed you in the next, as I'll show you in the next slide, to detect individual species. But it needs to be, as I mentioned before, it needs to be cheap, easy, quick, quantitative, etc. We want to be able to take a tissue sample from a prostate biopsy, for instance, uh, that we get through transrectal ultrasound and, and needle biopsy, or we want to be able to take a blood sample, right, where all these microRNAs are floating around, as I mentioned. We want to go straight from one of these tissues, extracting RNA, doing the array, and getting a quantitative answer, right? And so we've done that uh, by doing a couple neat molecular tricks and using a novel nanotechnology. So one of the things we do, just very quickly, is we take glass microscope slides. On the surface of that glass microscope slide are complements to every human microRNA that exists. We take RNA from a sample, whether it's tissue or from blood, and we link onto the end of that using a, a viral enzyme, as it turns out, a universal linker. So we take this green sequence and we ligate it to every single microRNA that we have in a specific sample. We hybridize that uh, to the surface of the arrays. The complementary sequences are sorted out based upon the presence of the complement on the surface of the array. And then we use a single gold nanoparticle that has DNA on its surface, just like the flare particle that I talked about before, that then binds to that universal sequence and develops the entire array with a single nanoparticle probe. We then amplify the signal uh, using a unique uh, trick basically a photographic developing solution that drastically increases the sensitivity and allows us to see very low copy numbers of nucleic acids. So again, this is the data that comes out of these types of experiments. And one of the things that you can do is begin to generate volcano plots like this when you're analyzing two different patient populations. So here what we've done is we've taken all the microRNAs that are being expressed by two different populations of patients. Those that have a Gleason score 9 prostate cancer, which is a very aggressive form of prostate cancer, and we're comparing it to the microRNA expression profile in patients that have a less aggressive form of prostate cancer, Gleason 6. The words aren't that important. It's just highly aggressive versus less aggressive. And what we're looking at is the difference in expression profile between the microRNA species that we've generated from these results, uh, from these arrays. Red means up, green means down. All the spots are individual microRNAs. So here we have now multiple microRNA species that may in fact be a signature for more aggressive disease. 
The red ones are overexpressed microRNAs in the serum of these patients. The green ones are microRNAs that have been repressed in the serum of these patients with differentiated versus less differentiated prostate cancer. So we can take these microRNAs and we can generate maps that look like this to understand the differences in expression in individuals with aggressive versus indolent cancer. Um, we can do hierarchical clustering and from these relatively complex maps, we can come down to individual microRNA profiles that may enable us to understand patients that have more aggressive versus less aggressive prostate cancer in a much simpler way than, of course, the hierarchical clustering figure that I showed you in the last slide. So here we've come up with three, three microRNAs that in a patient diagnosed with prostate cancer, we may be able to tell whether they have aggressive or more indolent prostate cancer. Of course, the patients with the more aggressive form, you'd need to treat early. The patients with the more indolent form, perhaps you could watch and wait to see whether or not it develops further into something that you'd need to treat. And so here it is, microRNA 106, overexpressed in those patients with aggressive versus those patients with indolent disease. MER 605, increased in indolent versus aggressive. MER 122, the same phenomenon. What happens after you've generated data like this is you need to validate them. You need to take that data that you've collected and then begin to understand whether or not it's pertinent, whether or not it's clinically relevant by, of course, studying much more larger numbers of patients to validate um, different biomarkers like the ones we've fished out of these big studies that I just uh, uh, discussed for you. So in conclusion, ideal biomarkers are those that have high sensitivity, high specificity. If they have disease, the biomarker's there. If they don't have the disease, the biomarker's not there. It's exactly what you're looking for. And typically, it's a balance as you develop new biomarkers in optimizing each one of those two parameters. They need to be cheap. They need to be easy, right? So Peter took you through a number of examples where we're taking into the scopes, going down in the stomach, sticking needles in the pancreas, and obtaining samples. So that's fantastic. It's a big time deal to be able to do that, right? And to be able to give patients the information that you get from biopsy samples that are obtained in that sort of fashion. Of course, that's highly costly. It's dangerous for the patient for reasons that Peter also mentioned, right? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to take a blood sample and identify those exact same biomarkers or ones like them to begin to understand whether or not the patient has a disease or not, and whether or not they, the patient's going to respond to a therapy or not, et cetera, right? And most of the time, Oftentimes, the biomarker doesn't, it's like fecal occult blood testing. The biomarker that you're looking for doesn't make the diagnosis, but allows you to take the next step into the more expensive, into the more, um, um, in, into the more costly um, diagnostic, um, uh, down the diagnostic path. So there are a few clinically validated and relevant biomarkers. So I gave you some examples on the slide very early on. Peter also mentioned a number of, of biomarkers that are clinically useful. We need a lot more, right? So we need you guys to go into the laboratory and identify biomarkers, develop new technologies that allow us to, um, to detect biological molecules across the spectrum of biological molecules. They can be anything, right? They can be anything that are specific to uh, the presence of a malignancy in the context of the homeostatic balance of a normal human being, right? What else? Um, I said that, and I said we need new technologies. And hopefully I've illustrated a couple of ways nanotechnology and perhaps physical sciences. I threw up the hierarchical clustering, not because I understand a great deal of that, but because mathematics, information technology, bioinformatics play a huge role in our ability to take huge data sets, uh, very complex data sets, and distill them down into much more simpler things, like a three microRNA profile, for instance, that we can then begin to contemplate using clinically in order to understand patient disease Diagnosis, prognosis, et cetera. All these things play a, a critical role. And with that, I'll finish uh, and take questions. Thanks.